the recording. Okay. So it is my great pleasure. Good morning to you all. How delighted we are to host today after Professor Mario Rasetti's first event, the second Tor Vergata Intesa San Paolo Global Governance Lecture today. As you know, Intesa San Paolo has decided to generously fund a three-year visiting professor global governance chair starting in 2022 with prestigious international scholars coming to Rome to teach in our program. <clears throat> and we are honored to celebrate with Stefano Lucchini, Chief Institutional Affairs and External Communica Communication Officer of Intesa San Paolo Group, the launching of this initiative with his presence here today. Hello, Stefano. Hi. Hi, Gustavo, how are you? Here we are. Great to have you here. The Thank recognition. You the recognition that is given to the quality of the global governance program and of its students with this joint agreement with Intesa San Paolo is obviously something that honors us and pushes the whole community forward with a stronger enthusiasm, something we badly need in these COVID times. Uh, Dr. Stefano Lucchini today will also coordinate a direct interview with our guest before giving the floor to our customary Q&A with the global governance student. <coughs> so right now it is time for me to welcome our prestigious guest, introduce him and leave him the floor for his uh, lecture. So Professor Rupert Younger, welcome today with us. Rupert is the founder and director of Oxford University's Center for Corporate Reputation. He's the co-author of the book, the, Co the Reputation Game, a best-selling book published uh, in October 2017 with David Waller and the co-author of the Activist Manifesto with Frank Parnoy, an extract of which was published in the Financial Times in March 2018 and which is forthcoming in various languages. His work and views are regularly featured in major news outlets, including BBC, CNN, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Times of London. He co-founded in 1994 the Finsbury Group, a global leader in strategic communications, and remained an active partner working on client mandates as global managing partner until 2018. He chaired the University of Oxford Socially Responsible Investment Committee of Council 2012 to 2017, and he's a member of the senior common rooms at Worcester College, Oxford, and of St. Anthony's College, still Oxford. He's a trustee of the International Mine Clearance and Humanitarian Charity, the Hilo Trust, and was appointed by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II as her High Sheriff of Hampshire for 2013 and 14. He's also a member of the Royal Company of Archers, the Queen's Bodyguard in Scotland. He is here today to share with us his views on a lecture title, The Reputation Game, Why Perceptions Matter More Today Than Facts. Rupert, thank you so much for being with us today. I leave you immediately the floor. Um, Gustavo, thank you very much. Um, Stefano, very nice to see you and um, thank you for making this uh, excellent series possible. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the previous session uh, with Professor Rossetti, and um, I'm hoping that we might find today also some connection between the AI conversations from a couple of weeks ago and the power of reputation, which is what we're going to talk about today. Now, um, uh, the very first thing to get right on these is the technology, so I'm going to try and share my screen uh, because I think it's probably helpful if I just show you visually some, um, some slides to back up my conversation. I'm deeply aware that Professor Rossetti had no slides when he presented. So uh, I'm hoping that I'm not breaking some convention by introducing some slides just to give some structure to the conversation. Um, so um, now, um, Gustavo, you'll need to make me a co-host so that I can share my screen. There you are. 
Okay. Okay, um, so I'm hoping, can everyone see that? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. At least we've got that right. Good. So um, I'm going to talk today about why perceptions, uh, which of course is the basis on which reputations are formed, uh, why perceptions matter today more than facts. Um, I'm going to start with a just a just a reference and anchor to the fact that reputations have been important for thousands of years. Um, scholars, writers, business leaders throughout the millennia have pointed to the fact that how you are perceived and this idea of your reputation um, has a commercial and social value. Uh, if you go back to Babilius Cyrus, a great thinker, a Latin scholar and thinker, uh, he talked about this two, 2000 years ago. Um, uh, you've got William Shakespeare in Othello, uh, reputation, reputation, reputation. Um, and he talks a lot about that um, subject. Two American presidents, Benjamin Franklin and Abraham Lincoln, uh, spent their time talking about reputation. And more recently, of course, the Sage of Omaha, um, Warren Buffett, uh, has talked about uh, reputation uh, with his very now, very, now very famous quote that uh, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. Now, I disagree with Warren Buffett. Um, it doesn't take 20 years to build a reputation. It doesn't just take five minutes to lose it. And by the end of this session, I hope you'll be in agreement with me and you'll be able to disagree with Warren Buffett. So why does, why, so why does this subject make any sense? Why is there even um, a deep academic center at the University of Oxford studying this question of reputation? Um, and it's because reputation really, really does matter. If you think about um, reputations, countries have them. If you think about the phrase made in China, immediately all of us start thinking about certain uh, attributes of that particular activity that Chinese firms do. People perhaps think about speed. They might think about um, lower value. They might think about mass production, but immediately your mind goes to a certain set of preconditions. If you think about America, um, uh, historically, of course, America was this beacon of Western democracy. Uh, and immediately you go to uh, think about, well, for me, I go to think about uh, enormous plates of food and I go to think about uh, music and, uh, and, and Hollywood and that sort of cultural drive. Um, uh, and Britain, um, of course, um, Great Britain, Made in Britain was a great industrial slogan for the 19th century as a mark of quality. Um, companies too, companies too have reputations and actually the very large companies that dominate the markets today have built their entire models based on reputation. If you think about Airbnb, Airbnb, uh, as you know, has uh, owners of properties and they have renters of properties. And each of those two critical players in that industry rates each other. So what, what customers say about a property dictates its attractiveness and what the property says about the customer dictates their ability to... Uh, to. Now there's a, uh, uh, Gustavo, there's a hum on the line. Is that a problem for everyone or not? Not yet, no. Not yet, okay. Um, Turn it down. Um, uh, the, um, and of course, it matters for products as well. So um, uh, sine qua non, um, uh, which is the product you see on the bottom, uh, it's a phrase, of course, but it's also a wine in California. And this is a wine, um, those of you obviously from Italy and from France and uh, from, the, from, from Europe uh, naturally think we have a monopoly on uh, the quality of wine. Um, but this is a wine which trades on its reputation. It's the second most expensive wine in the world behind Petrus. Um, it sells at $4,600 per bottle. 
Um, and it's entirely based on this idea of the wine. Uh, they do a really clever set of techniques to uh, have people thinking about this wine as being something really special. So reputations drive country reputations, they create markets, and they, are, uh, and they underpin how products uh, work and are competitive. Uh, we have just have to think about the COVID crisis uh, to understand that reputations matter. Um, if uh, AstraZeneca today uh, is undergoing some really pretty um, testing times when it comes to its reputation, uh, it's had the highs of being first out of the blocks with a vaccine and it's now got the lows of failing to meet certain commitments that it made on the manufacturing. Um, if we think about um, this uh, thematic story, um, uh, which has all been about the reputation of business and of political leaders in tackling uh, the climate crisis. Uh, this is Greta using reputation mechanisms to bring a massive issue right to the fore. Um, and this more recent one, you could think about the crisis in the British royal family, uh, which has uh, taken place over the last very publicly, sadly, over the last uh, year or so, um, as the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have decided to relocate to America. So um, reputation stories are everywhere. They affect countries, they affect uh, businesses, and they affect products, and they affect us as individuals. And what we've done at Oxford is to sort of break down the idea that reputation um, has three application lenses, if you like. Firstly, in the area of legitimacy and creating value. So AstraZeneca has obviously had a huge um, uh, value, um, uh, positive and then negative hit from, uh, from the reputation that they uh, developed throughout the COVID crisis. Um, Greta has created a movement uh, using reputation mechanisms. And of course, you've got crisis and scandal. Now, um, the causes of all this, um, and I'm going to go, just go back a little bit in history, um, because it's quite useful to anchor the fact that while we think reputation is really a very modern phenomenon driven by the internet, social media companies, actually it's got a very, very long historical tale to it. Reputation was important way back in um, 1500 BC with Phoenician traders. Uh, who established trading links and trading routes and trading relationships based on uh, real reputations um, and reputation currencies. Uh, way back in those days, um, payment was made um, in um, goods and services. So you'd pay someone in a bushel of corn, but you then, then receive a token back, uh, these clay um, cuneiforms, which signaled that you'd paid some money. Now, these clay cuneiforms were the oldest forms of money uh, that we know of, but they were essentially trust mechanisms and reputation mechanisms, because what they did is they were passed from person to person, and they were a statement that that person who was, who was codified on the cuneiform was good for that money. So reputation has underpinned financial forms and flows for thousands of years. If we go, come a bit more modern into the middle picture here was the Merchant of Venice, that's Shylock, of course, and the development of modern finance started actually, funnily enough, in modern Italy or in, or in Renaissance Italy um, with the development of modern banking. Um, and uh, the capitalist crisis that's, um, that's happened after the financial crash in, in 2007 eight uh, has intensified calls for a capitalism rethink and intensified the role that reputation plays now in driving businesses. So why is reputation so valuable in markets? I'm gonna just, um, just anchor three simple ideas with you. Um, first of all, it facilitates the way in which goods and services are exchanged. It stops people from behaving badly and it confers legitimacy. If we think about the first of these, this idea of facilitating market exchanges, um, if a market is fully efficient and everyone knows everything about everyone, which of course never happens, but that, that's what an efficient, a fully efficient market would be, then there would be
their perceptions and half the time, the gossip of what we hear. Um, so uh, reputation uh, matters um, uh, when the costs of gathering information are high, but it takes, it takes time to gather real information. It means that you rely on gossip. And also when the cost of enforcing contracts is high. So if the cost of it actually, actually checking someone and then enforcing a contract is very high, you'll go with reputation and you'll use reputational sanctions. A really good, um, really good example here, if we come back to uh, the idea of um, Italy as a center for banking, but actually that then developed into a European phenomenon uh, with the emergence of these family firms. And the best example was the Rothschild family. The Rothschild family, uh, five brothers, who set up finance trading hubs in Frankfurt, London, Paris, Vienna, and Naples. And they were able to create the first global bank, if you like, uh, by having reputation and trust right at the heart. So you could transact in Paris and be paid in Vienna the same day. And that was something which was extraordinary if you think about it back in the 1750s to 1800s. Uh, and that and, and, and family ties have underpinned the ability to transact with confidence. Um, since the Middle Ages, um, merchants who built reputations in one space in trade often then went into banking because banking enabled them to translate their reputation capital into other sources of activity. JP Morgan, uh, the founder of the uh, eponymous bank, JP Morgan, um, he started out in trade, Anglo-American trade, in fact, um, uh, and then trade finance, and then moved into banking. So he um, transferred his reputation. Uh, and so this idea of reputation being something that sticks with you as an individual and takes and, and, and transfers with you no matter where you go. Um, it's also the case that reputations were built within business networks and social networks together. So these clubs emerge, these sort of ideas of um, people being the right sort of people. You started to coalesce um, uh, these groups of people around their reputations. So I would like to be in business with someone who I feel has a good reputation. I would like to be a colleague or a partner with someone who I feel uh, is, shares my reputation. Um, and that's why uh, faith groups um, started to emerge as reputation groups in banking, uh, Christian and Jewish bankers being one of them. But you then saw this idea of gentleman bankers, this idea that only certain people with the right backgrounds and the right reputations could actually become part of a trading entity. Um, so uh, that, that's the first thing about facilitating market exchanges. The second thing is that reputations stop people from behaving badly. Now, this is a picture of uh, what uh, was the first coffee shop uh, at the Lloyd's market in London. So the Lloyd's insurance market is now a global underwriting market and Lloyd's underwrites risky propositions. It might be any form of risk. And this um, came about, this ma major market today, came about from a coffee shop in the centre of the city of London. And this was the coffee shop. And what happened there is that uh, the shipping trade was the riskiest business to be in in the 1700s. Think about it. You would put your goods uh, onto a ship. You'd entrust that, that, that uh, cargo of cotton, let's say, from America into the hands of um, a group of people you'd never met, a captain and his crew. You'd be allowing that, that ship to then cross the Atlantic, uh, um, having to navigate uh, privateers, pirates, um, often state um, naval, uh, naval patrol vessels like the French, trying to take over English trading routes in very risky enterprise. And then when, you, when, when the goods finally arrived in London, you'd hope that the captain and his crew hadn't um, thieved or taken or stolen half of the product as well, a very risky enterprise. So this, this Lloyds of London market set up as a gossip shop. This was the time when uh, owners of um, goods and services would say, who's the best captain? Who can I trust with my goods and services? Who's got the best crew? Which ship is not going to sink? These, this was all about gossip. So reputations then became the anchor stone for the global insurance market. And it stopped P 
people cheating. Um, if we look at that on a wider scale, um, one of the most extraordinary stories that comes from reputation is the 11th century Jewish Maghribi traders of North Africa. This is the very, very final end, this, the extended end of the Silk Route that took place all the way from China uh, through to Northern Lebanon. And then in the latter part, then wound its way across North Africa as a really productive trading route. And this was an incredible story in reputation. If you think about giving um, a, um, a trader with uh, maybe a group of other traders in a big, big caravan of traders, all of your goods in Benghazi, and you allowed them two or three months to wind their way across northern Africa, ending up in Marrakesh or Casablanca, um, and you would entrust them with all of your life savings, your goods and services, based on the knowledge that they wouldn't cheat. Now, what gave you that confidence? What gave you that confidence is because this was a group who traded on their reputation. They traded on the fact that they would never let anyone down. Now, so this was um, a really powerful mechanism that produced the ability for people to trade and transact over huge areas. Once people started working out that reputation was important, they started to think about whether you could formalize this in sort of regulatory terms. And the British started this. Uh, uh, this was the idea of medieval guilds. Um, and this was the first attempt at trying to put some formal structures around reputation. Um, these guilds, uh, for example, the Mercers, Mercers were traders, they were traders who traded goods, and they formed a, a, an association which was a sort of club which enabled people to join it or be ejected from it, depending on whether they behaved properly. And so reputation became a badge. It became something which you wore with pride. Uh, the idea of becoming a gilded merchant someone who was a member of a guild, was a seriously high status symbol uh, all the way through uh, 15th, 16th and 17th century Britain. And even today, those clubs still exist. Um, my word is my bond is a phrase that's used in the city of London. And uh, this idea of joining these elite private members clubs today still relies on reputation. So this idea that there would be a more formal codification started to emerge um, in the Middle Ages as well. By the 19th century, this had become a business. This is the business of the Brad Street, of the Brad Street Company, which became Dunn and Brad Street, which now has become the credit companies of today. So this is the business of assessing whether someone is credit worthy. And what the Bradstreet Company did in America is they used reputation. And this was their 36 reputation questions. What they did is they had these 36 questions, which they went into a town. And if you were a business in the town, they would credit rate you based on these 36 questions. Now, they wouldn't ask you this. They'd ask everyone who knows you these questions. Does he make money? Does he make money rapidly? Does she lose money? Does she lose money rapidly? Does he have large expenses? Is she very, is she very economical? Is the business extended, not extended? Are they temperate? Which means do they drink too much or not? These were entirely reputation constructs. And the Bradstreet Company, the Dun & Bradstreet Company, rested its entire business model on assessing what people thought about other companies, the idea of your credit reference. So it became, and that's underpinned modern finance as we see it today. It underpins the entire architecture of the buying and lending and borrowing industry today. So reputation really has a very fundamental role to play. If you think about that today, um, this is eBay. If you think about eBay, what is eBay except for a reputation marketplace? Uh, what you do is you buy or sell, uh, and, and you buy or sell uh, with a degree of confidence based on ratings and feedback. And that's entirely a reputation marketplace. 
So not only has reputation existed for thousands of years, not only has it underpinned how the city of London was established, the global insurance markets were established, global trading and currency markets have been established, but it underpins the technology boom of the last 20 years. The third area is it confers legitimacy on markets and market activities. Um, and legitimacy is a very modern subject because the question of the legitimacy of business today has never been more pertinent. What is business here to do? Who does it serve? And does it do its job well enough? The firms with bad reputations really did a very big disservice to the whole of business. And this happened uh, right the way through the 19th century, the 18th and 19th century, when the big businesses of the day, which were unregulated, um, uh, were, were, were just incredibly badly behaved. This was a cartoon of big business dominating Congress in America. The idea here being that uh, the congressmen, uh, the small people in the front who represented the people of America had these very large, big, powerful corporations sitting behind them, pulling their strings. Um, and it went against this idea that businesses should be fair to all. Um, and that Congress should represent small and large businesses equally. So business for many years was illegitimate and reputation became the mechanism which, the, which policymakers started to use to hold them to account. The most um, uh, controversial forms on this side of the Atlantic were the chartered companies. Now, um, the best example actually, if you look back, is the East India Company. Now the East India Company was at its time, um, if you think about Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, all together, all together, they weren't as big and as powerful as the East India Company. This was just how big this trading enterprise was. And it was an extraordinary thing. It was one of the world's least responsible and evil companies and it was state sanctioned. They had monopoly pri privileges granted by the crown to do trading. This was at a time when, of course, Britain was trying to establish global trading routes with China and access to the East Indies, which is where all of this incredible new products like spices and silks was coming from. This was deemed to be a national priority. So the government at the time granted a monopoly license to these group of 100 names who said they were going to embark in a very risky enterprise of creating a company which would trade with the East Indies. But, uh, but often it then became the case that the members of parliament invested themselves in this company. So it became this big, big state-backed enterprise. And they became a tool of the empire. Uh, they were one of the least responsible companies of their time. They created an army. Can you imagine a company today being allowed to create its own army? This is what this company was allowed to do. It, the army was established in 1746, but it was dissolved in Parliament in 1858. Now, when you think about armies, think about also um, the non-physical armies that exist with the biggest companies today. Think about the armies of delivery drivers that Amazon have. Think about the armies of technology experts and IT um, systems that, that Google has. This is, in a sense, there's a parallel that scale and size gives you outsized power, and with outsized power becomes irresponsible behavior. Now, uh, the East India Company went on to gain control of most of India. Uh, it not only tried to uh, um, quell uprisings, but it created uprisings in a whole range of places. Uh, it engaged and created the opium wars with China. Um, so this is a company, then remember this is a company which became uh, a very irresponsible major trading force. Um, in, re in response to the East India Company, uh, the British government and then all of Europe changed their corporate laws. So the corporate form became less controversial when it was suddenly opened up to everyone in 1844. This was in America and also in Europe. 
but it still didn't solve the problem that some companies were allowed to be too big. Now, th these bigger companies were held to account by the financial press um, and regulation, but it still was a problem. And today you can see the likes of the Amazons of this world still behaving in ways where they are subject to a lot of reputational attack and reputational scrutiny. Now, the final bit of the setup is that today, hyperconnectivity is different. In 17, 1800s, 1900s, you didn't have broadband. And with broadband, you have hyperconnectivity. And with hyperconnectivity, you've got this supercharging of the power of reputation. Suddenly, everyone everywhere can know the detail from one person's experience through a tweet. And that changes the nature and the connectivity nature of reputation. Where this is going um, is this. This is a picture of China's social credit score system. Now, for those of you who've studied China, I think it's an incredibly interesting place to study for lots of reasons. They've developed now this state-sponsored reputation system called the, called the social credit score system. And it turns out that they're going to now be judging individuals across two financial metrics, two normal metrics, but three reputation metrics. And this is every single Chinese citizen, 1.4 billion people are going to be analysed for number one, what I call their friendship quotient, which is if I'm a friend with Stefano, which I am, and Stefano posts something negative about the Chinese state, Stefano obviously gets a bad rating because he's posted something negative about the Chinese state. But in addition to Stefano getting derated, I get derated because I'm a friend of Stefano's. So this friendship quotient is the linkage it's on the social feeds. Secondly, they're going to look at your behavior. So if I sit and play games in my room and don't do anything for society, I get a low rating. And if I do some good stuff and I'm a teacher or I do something different, then I get a high rating. Um, and the third is my fulfillment criteria, which is if I agree to meet someone at, at one o'clock and I'm an hour late, I get a low rating. But if I agree to meet someone and I'm on time, I get a reliability rating. So this is now becoming a new world where states are now putting in place reputation systems. And when people uh, in the West think about this, we all tend to get a bit upset about this. We start to think this is Big Brother. It's a look back at George Orwell and you know Animal Farm and all of this stuff. Well, I would argue maybe but actually all this is doing is formalizing in a state system what we have as Western market practices anyway. Um, for those of us uh, who still have Uber in our countries, uh, you have an Uber rating. If you, uh, and I'm sure all of you use Uber, and so you'll all know your rating. Is it 4.2, 4.3, 4.4? That matters. We're, we're all rated everywhere. It's just a question of who does the rating. So this is a new world and, and reputation is underpinning it. Now, in that context, um, I'm gonna just quickly ask you a couple of polls and I'm going to also then just take you through the mechanisms that give you some degree of influence over your reputation. Rupert, Hopefully what we'll Rupert, do in this section Rupert, is- to, you yes? to make me a host because I made you a host because my connection was going to go down. I will make you a co-host, yeah. Okay. No, 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 make me a host, switch the host, and then I will go give you back the co-host. Okay, all right, hold on one second. Sorry about that, but uh, it was to avoid uh, collapse in the system. Make a co-host, yeah? No, no, make me host. Well, hang on a sec, there you go. I, I'm just gonna make, make you a co-host because that's, that's fine. So you should be okay now. I should be okay? You should be okay. Okay, so you want me to start? Not yet, but um, so, so what I'm gonna do in this final section for the last 15, 20 minutes is just take you through the three different levers that are, that are within your control. So we've established that reputation is important. If it's important, what can you do to influence it? And this is gonna show you how. 
So the first thing is just, let's just take a look at what is reputation. Gustavo, put the poll up. Thank you very much. So I hope it's gonna work, huh? You should okay. see it, guys. Yep. We can see it. Rani, you have to vote. So if you everyone just vote. puts their answers. I'm looking at the answers. I still have many. I still have uh, many to vote yet. I still have some some to vote. I think it's enough. One answer is enough, guys. Eh? Guys, one answer only. Stop. I'll stop the polling. I have plenty of answers. OK, good. So we've got um, most people are saying no. Uh, the reputation and brand are not the same thing. And you are correct. They're not the same thing. Um, some are saying yes, and we're going to disavow you of what that means. So um, I'm going to stop that sharing there, Gustavo, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, so just take the poll off. Um, so the, the link between identity, brand, and reputation goes as follows. Your identity as an organization is your DNA. Now, your brand is what you want to be seen as. If your brand is done really well and the design is done really well, it'll reflect your identity, your DNA. And your reputation is what you're actually seen as. So your brand is what you want to be seen as, what your reputation is what you're actually seen as. Now, there's many examples of where an organization, let's take VW. VW may want us to see it in a very positive light, but after the VW scandal, many of us saw VW in a very different light to what they wanted us to see it as. Okay, so this is the definition which I use, expectations about an organization's future behavior or performance based on perceptions of past behavior or performance. And the two, two words I want you to just remember there are expectations and perceptions. So the second poll, who decides? Who decides on your reputation? Um, Gustavo, if you would launch the second poll. So you have choices here. Go. I decide, everyone else decides. Everyone, including me, decides. No one or don't know. So one vote each, and we'll see if we can get up to up, up to close to 100% of people voting. We're at 60%. Keep going. I'm not stopping. I have a nearly three quarters of the way through. 75% of people voting. That's good. But before okay. they did not vote a lot because I stopped earlier. Okay, it was my mistake. <laughs> that's fine. Okay, look, I think we can stop there. 80% vote, that's pretty good. So we can stop, stop there. I stop. Stop there and share the results. Okay, so there's the results. Um, uh, everyone, everyone else and me are the three uh, with a couple of no ones and don't knows. So um, the answer is everyone else. Uh, they decide, so my, let, let me give you the example. The example is my reputation here with you today. So who controls my reputation here today? Now I can of course try and influence it. I can try and say something intelligent. I can have Gustavo say nice things about me. I can have Stefano and I have a really nice set of conversations afterwards. But ultimately you are the ones who decide whether this was a really useful valuable hour or whether this was a waste of your time. So you decide on my reputation. And that makes it something, and we can stop sharing this now, Gustavo, thank you very much. Um, you decide. And uh, so this concept is that you don't own your reputation, it's owned by others. You can influence it, but not control it. Um, you have a different set of reputations at stake. So the, the second thing I wanna just persuade you of is that, it, that you don't have a singular reputation. Everyone has lots of different reputations. BP may have a positive reputation with US regulators for safety in deep water drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, or a negative one rather. And it may have a positive reputation with partners for major financial and project management expertise in large easy oil projects. 
Goldman Sachs may have a bad reputation with the US public for its role as a vampire squid in the financial crisis, and it may have a good reputation with finance MBAs for being the number one employer of choice. So this idea is again, super important that an organization has multiple reputations for certain things with different audiences. And it's liberating because it allows you to choose what matters to you and to invest your influence strategy in achieving that. So um, what are the influence strategies? There are three, and I'm gonna take you very quickly through each one and then we'll open up to some questions. So the first one is obvious, which is that if you want a reputation for something, you've got to behave that way. You can't create a reputation based on uh, a lie or something that's not um, actually evidenced in what you do. It turns out that if you're having, uh, <coughs> um, if we're looking at behavior, um, that there are two really valuable lenses. And this is probably the one thing I'd hope that you might remember of this entire presentation, because it's the best possible insight from our research, is that reputations have a Janus face. There are two dimensions. The first is perceptions of capability, which is my thinking of what do I expect that organization to be able to do? In Stefano's case at Intesa, excellence in financial services, uh, a banking set of products, all of these things are perceptions of the capability of the organization. But then the second lens has got nothing to do with what they do, actually produce or how good they are. It's, it's their corporate character. And that's about what type of an organization do I think they are? Are they gonna be a fair employer? Do they treat the suppliers well? What sort of um, uh, transparency can I see coming out of this organization? Um, uh, what sort of societal commitments? So think of these two lenses, perceptions of capability, which is what I think I'm able to do, or what I think you're able to do, and perceptions of character. A couple of examples, and we're gonna run these as a poll, so if you think of the VW scandal, uh, which is the Volkswagen scandal, where they cheated about the emissions, they lied about the emissions that came out, and the United Airlines scandal, where if you remember, that poor man was offboarded off the United Airlines um, plane and dragged off the plane. Would you say, and we, uh, Gustavo, if you launch poll number three, would you say that these are examples of capability, ba bad capability or bad character? We'll put the polling up. Are these examples of bad- You give only one answer. Or bad character? People giving this a bit more thought, I can see. A little bit slower off the mark. Um, so we're just over half the people have voted. Let's keep going till we get to 75%. Inching up there, keep voting. Those who haven't voted, keep voting. Okay, we're at 75%, let's stop there, Gustavo. Okay, and share the results. So the results, bad character over bad capability. The bad character is of course the right answer. Um, this is, uh, these are two examples of where no one doubts that VW make good, make good cars or that United Airlines can fly you from A to B. What they just don't like is the fact that, uh, that they lie and cheat um, in VW's case, um, or they um, try and deflect blame in United's case. So um, those are examples of perceptions of character problems. By contrast, um, if we take a look at poll number four, um, Gustavo, uh, these are two examples, uh, a Toyota braking scandal, where they had this uh, major problem with their braking systems, um, uh, which caused the largest, caused a very fatal crash in uh, San Diego and the largest corporate apology in Japan ever. And Equifax, which is a credit reporting company, which had, uh, which deals with data, which had a data breach. Um, so if we launch the poll, are these, in your view, um, perceptions of bad capability or bad character? So, oh, bad capability getting 100% now, couple of bad characters coming in. 
Okay, we're at nearly 50%. We'll keep going till we get to 75. Very good, keep going. Anyone who hasn't voted? Keep going, we're nearly there. Just a few more votes to count. Okay, we're gonna stop there, Gustavo. We're nearly there, I think that's good enough. It's very clear, these are, uh, uh, um, these are perceptions of bad capability. So, um, you see what we mean about these two perceptions. And it's uh, sometimes you'll see actually combinations of both. So BP, for example, I think you could argue that the initial feeling was poor capability because it couldn't block an oil well spill. But as it started to behave badly and started to make comments like, I want my life back, and as uh, they uh, sort of became increasingly arrogant, uh, there were perceptions about poor character. Now, the reason why this is important is because capability reputations are very hard to lose. So back to the Warren Buffett point. He says it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to lose it. It's clearly not the case. A capability reputation, it may take 20 years to build, but once you've got it, it takes a long, long time to lose it. BP is still in business. VW is still in business. These are businesses which are still seen as very capable. Um, character, by contrast, is very volatile. You could, it's very easy to lose and gain. And the impact is felt differently um, uh, through uh, customers care about capability, whereas counterparties, by which we mean suppliers, employees, investors, seem to care more about character. So those two dimensions, have that in the back of your mind. If there's one thing you take away from this morning, have it as that. Okay, the second strategy, and I'm gonna just quickly finish on these two because they're reasonably quick uh, before we hand over to Q&A, um, uh, is your network. So information and reputations are created between people. If I'm a Buddhist monk and I sit on my hill in the top of, uh, 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 in Tibet, um, and, I, and I've never met anyone in my life, I may have the best behavior in the world, but because I know no one and no one knows me, I don't have a reputation. So reputation, it's, an, it's, it's a relational construct that sits in and between people. Because it's relational, the networks and the network structures matter. So network structures, very quickly. On the left here, you see what we call an open network in sociology. Now I'm an economist, so I'm uh, borrowing from my friend Ron Burt, who's, a, who's one of the world's leading sociologists based in Chicago. Robert and Jessica here on the left-hand side are part of an open network. You'll see there's a dotted line, which means Robert doesn't know Jessica very well, and Jessica doesn't know Robert very well. More importantly, Robert's friends, denoted by the black dots, do not know Jessica's friends, denoted by these black dots. So that's an open network. By contrast, here, Robert and Jessica, in a closed network, know each other very well, thick line. And more importantly, Robert's friends know Jessica's friends and vice versa. Everyone knows everyone. This network here, a closed network, you can imagine being like a family. So a family unit. Now, I don't want to talk about your families, but in most families, information, does it move slow or fast? Normally, hyper fast, especially if it's juicy gossip. Secondly, does information move in a family with a great deal of certainty or with a degree of mistrust? Normally with a high degree of certainty because you've got that regular contact and that high degree of trust. So closed networks have fast information flow and information moves with certainty. Whereas open networks, it's different. <laughs> Okay, so that's the first uh, concept on networks. Just a couple of other things. Um, reputation by association matters in networks. So for example, if you're headquartered in Russia as an organization, you'll be thought about in certain ways versus if you're headquartered in Spain or France or America. Uh, the signaling effects. Um, if I have board members on my company, 
who are very high status people, really, really excellent, that's a sign that I've got high reputation. And the third is obviously um, the, uh, the who you associate with in terms of opinion influencers um, and others. The man on the right, the picture on the right here was probably one of the best network players I've ever met. He's also sadly one of the world's biggest fraudsters. Uh, he's Bernie Madoff from Madoff Securities, who is in prison now until the year 2148. But it shows you that networks can be used for bad as well as for good. Now, the third and final strategy that you have is your narrative. This is how you choose to talk about yourself. And I'm going to show you a short film, uh, which is uh, one of the best examples of a really powerful narrative, uh, which had incredibly powerful outcomes and results. Uh, let me just play you the film, and then we'll talk a little bit about it afterwards. The actual experience exceeds all expectations. And there's something that's hard to put in words. All these things that may seem big and impossible are not. It gives people that type of energy, that type of power. Okay, so who'd buy tickets for that? I think most of us, right? It looked amazing, right? This, this promise of this incredible party, brilliant bands surrounded by gorgeous people on beautiful beaches in the sunshine. Who wouldn't kind of think that was kind of great? The truth is, and that was a narrative. The truth is, the actual it wasn't true. This was one of the biggest frauds that's happened in the entertainment industry in the last 10 years. This was, a, um, uh, this was an event organized by Billy McFarland and Ja Rule. Uh, it was supposed to be organized over two weekends in 2017. They sold 4,000 plus tickets immediately. People were queuing to come to this. Um, VIP packages and tents were sold. Um, uh, wristbands uh, could be loaded up with $2,000, $3,000 worth of, of spending money for the weekends. Um, the problem was it wasn't true. Um, they promised a, desert, a, a deserted island formerly owned by Pablo Escobar. They actually broke the terms of a contract and so they couldn't get that island. So they ended up having um, uh, a, a, a windy rock strewn um, uh, place on Grand Exuma. They promised modern, modern eco-friendly geodesic domes, but they ended up having to erect basically disaster relief tents and they didn't even manage to get them up in time. So all the mattresses that were supposed to go in the tents were left outside and it rained. So everything was soaked. Um, uh, it, they promised uniquely authentic island cuisine, but they ended up with, uh, with sandwiches. Um, uh, they, they promised a cashless and cardless event, but because they had to move the island, there was no Wi-Fi. So, they could, so people couldn't use the money they put onto their wristbands. And uh, it, it ended up basically being a disaster and both of them are now in jail for, for defrauding people uh, to the tune of a lot of money. It's, this, it's the subject of now two great, great films and documentaries. One is Fire Fraud and Netflix has got one Fire, uh, which is worth having a look at. It's an extraordinary story, but it shows you the power 
of narratives. And great stories never die. Um, so uh, what are the great narratives? It turns out that there are seven. And I'm going to finish with this. Um, mainly because it gives you a choice to think about your own narrative and where it sits within these seven. So it turns out that seven stories, seven big frames, underpin all the great stories in history. The first of them is this idea of overcoming the monster. Okay, great stories. I mean, there's obviously that's Jaws, the film, um, but great, great stories around. Um, if you go back into uh, classical mythology, this was this was Scylla and Charybdis and Odysseus. You know, great stories around the monster and how humankind overcame. Corporately, Airbnb use that as their narrative because in Airbnb's narrative, they're the modern new company coming to change the way in which the hotel industry is done. Who's the big monster in Airbnb's narrative? It's Hilton Hotels, it's Starwood Hotels. They're the unfriendly, old style, overly expensive, too structured systems, which they're there to change. So that's their narrative frame. Secondly, rags to riches. The second narrative frame, obviously Cinderella, um, great story. Pretty Woman, any of these type of things, all great stories around rags to riches. Corporately, it's where Facebook started, right? Now, you can argue that it may not be a rags to riches story because they started in a Harvard dorm as opposed to a, um, uh, a non uh, sort of private school dorm. But their whole narrative was based on this idea of these were two school kids, university kids who dropped out and who went on to create one of the world's leading companies. The problem for Facebook is that they haven't moved on. They still think that's their frame, but actually they're no longer the rags to riches story. They're the rich story who other people are now trying to overtake. The third is the quest. Now this is obviously Lord of the Rings. Uh, there's many, many great, great um, historical and literary um, stories uh, based around the idea of a quest and financial which is uh, a, a, a Chinese um, company uh, in financial services, done a fantastic job in building their narrative around this idea of a quest. And that's because they're fundamentally reshaping your relationship with money. They're no longer saying that you've got to rely on a credit card here and a bank account here. Everything's going to be seamless and done for your benefit through your technology and your systems. They, they, they genuinely look like crusaders. And when you go into their offices, that's how it feels. Voyage and return, the fourth. This is obviously Alice in Wonderland, great story. And there's wonderful stories again, if you think about the Iliad and the Odyssey again, the Iliad and the Odyssey, both a great, great voyage and return story. Um, corporately, I'd argue the banks are there. They, uh, they're trying to get back to their glory days. They had this great voyage and then they went into trouble and they're trying to get back to being systemically seen as a good thing. Comedy, fifth story area. Now it's a difficult one for companies and organizations to be in, but it's a very powerful one if you get it right. Um, the Dollar Shave Club is one of the companies that I think does this really, really well. If you look at all their advertising, it's got great comedic value, the way they position themselves. The sixth area is tragedy. Now, no one ever sets out to be in the tragedy area, but you can find yourself there. And the game is not to stay there too long. Um, I think probably the most tragic story for quite a long time was IBM. IBM was this incredible technology company, which for certainly all of your lives, basically fell out of favor and it became this sort of irrelevance. It's now starting to come back. It started to reinvent itself a little bit. So perhaps it's on a voyage and return sort of story arc now. But for years, IBM was a really sad story. And the final one is Rebirth. This is obviously Christmas Carol um, uh, uh, and that's Scrooge, uh, the famous idea that he then saw the error of his ways and was reborn. Corporately, the best possible example of a rebirth story has got to be Apple. Apple, when it started, was this very unfriendly technology used by developers and Steve Jobs dramatically changed and the rest, of course, is history and is now one of the world's most valuable companies. So um, 
What's your story? Is what I'm going to challenge you to think about. And where do you sit? Either as an individual or as part of your organisation if you're in that stage of your life. So, um, in summary, reputations matter. They're an important signal of your capabilities and character. They open doors, facilitate negotiations, assist alignment in global governance. And facts matter, but only sometimes. Um, there's a great quote that, the, that, the, that reputation has already run around the world by the time truth gets its sneakers on. And it's true. It's, it's, it's true that facts can matter, but only sometimes. And the increasing prevalence of fake news and AI increases the importance of the way in which reputations are formed. So I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, I'm going to now hand over to Stefano and we can open up for a discussion, um, uh, first of all, with Stefano, and then we'll take some questions from anyone who has any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ah, okay, grazie. Grazie, Gustavo. Thank you very much, Rupert. Uh, you did a very good job, and uh, as usual. And uh, I, I think, uh, I, think uh, I hope the audience uh, appreciated that. And uh, so I, I will make just a very uh, small few questions uh, uh, just to leave the, the floor to the, to the students. Uh, you, you, you spoke in the very last uh, of, uh, of um, uh, sentences, uh, you spoke about um, uh, fake news. Uh, can I ask you something on how governments, organizations, institutions most effectively correct uh, fake news and if it is possible? Listen, Stefano, that's, that's a fantastic question um, because it's very difficult. Um, uh, many of you will have seen the deep fakes that exist on the web, and now it's incredibly easy to make a really, really authentically kind of real deep fake, if I can juxtapose those two things. Um, so just to make it real, um, we could create in probably 10 minutes a video of Gustavo saying uh, some deeply hateful things um, about Stefano. Uh, we could have him say this in, with his own face, his own words. Uh, it would seem like it was spontaneous. Uh, and that could come out. And as soon as that hits, Gustavo is on the back foot, right? Because he's got to ring Stefano and say, that wasn't me. Mm -hmm. Okay, but it looks like him. And Stefano might think, well, okay, but that is you. And it looked like you. And actually, I think that I am mean, going to blame you for this. So it's very disruptive. Fake news is very disruptive. And AI and technology makes fake news look really real. So what can organizations do and you as individuals do to protect yourself? The first thing is that um, you've got to be fast, okay? Um, if someone says something which is a fake, call it out and really quickly. So mm -hmm. for example, if someone calls, um, posts something and it has your background as being um, in an office and, it, and it's posted saying that th this has just come up, post yourself outside and say, I'm not in the office, I'm here. Um, uh, there might be geolocators on your posts, use them. Um, organizations are increasingly now using um, techniques to try and capture um, the diaries, if you like, of, of executives to prove that they could never have said that in the forum that they did say that. Um, so speed is very important, number one. Secondly, using your own technology to combat it. So um, I think one of the most effective ways to do, uh, to combat this type of stuff is actually to use humor back. So I think actually that if someone uses a piece of, so if someone creates a piece of fake uh, media, create one back, um, play it back to them and it defuses people. It makes it clear that this is a forum for, like fake news, as opposed to a forum and a discussion about things that are real. Um, I certainly don't have all the answers, Stefano, but there's just some thoughts. So speed and technology. Yes. Uh, thank you, Rupert. And uh, you, you talk about uh, AI. Um, what implications does AI uh, for reputations today? Um, 
again, a critical question. AI, um, AI uh, is making reputation way, way, way more important. And it's because of this AI, people think of AI as being able to do extraordinary things. Um, I'd encourage you to read a book by Janelle Shane. Um, uh, she's, a, she's a wonderful American author um, and internet blogger. And she's written a book called, You Look Like a Thing and I Love You, okay? And it basically is a story about how we think AI is this incredible technology that can do everything, but actually AI is really inept. AI can do, it can, can hardly do anything. And the problem with AI is that it's trained on data sets, which themselves are either biased or incomplete. So when you think about training data sets for AI, that's where reputation is now becoming way more important, Stefano, because um, now AI is being trained on data sets that either are racially biased, uh, they're Western, or they may be um, uh, driven by sort of tech geeks as opposed to non-tech geeks. And so when you feed that information into AI, of course you get outcomes that are biased, tech geeky or something else. Um, now reputations uh, are uh, being used to counteract that. So when AI says that something has happened or something should happen, there's a sense check being done by reputations. And so reputations are gonna become more important, not less. Thank you, Rupert. Just the last question, maybe. Um, and this is, a, this is very difficult, I guess, uh, to have an answer. But uh, how often do people get the reputations they deserve? <laughs> um, well, of course, most people think that they never get the reputations they deserve because they want to be both, you know, um, uh, saint and, um, you know, sort of, you know, all the good things and none of the bad things. I think the truth of it is that on the whole, reputation systems are a pretty effective marketplace for ideas and views. And on the whole, reputations kind of settle around what's reasonably deserved. So if you're broadly a reasonable business person, broadly speaking, that's where your reputation will settle. If you're broadly speaking a criminal, broadly speaking, your reputation will settle around that. Can you play with those reputations and have an undeserved reputation for a period of time? Yes, you can sometimes actually for quite a long period of time. The best example of that was Bernie Madoff. I, I come back to Bernie Madoff, the Madoff security scandal, where for something like uh, 20 plus years, he was able to convince people of Very something good. that he was not. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, I think people get the reputations they deserve. Thank you, Rupa. Maybe Gustavo, I think it's time to give uh, the, the floor to the, to the to the students and thank I will you. I will be in any case in uh, in uh, connected with you thank you so much Stefan and thank you Rupert thank you, so we're thank you Stefan thank you Rupert Rupert how you want to do it you want to take two three at a time one at a time I'm at your disposal so Gustavo exactly how you'd like, like okay that. so let's start with Gabriele please introduce yourself as usual so hello and uh, thank you ex so much for this extremely interesting presentation. Thank you for being uh, today uh, with us. And I'm Gabriele Diana uh, from uh, Global Governance, second year student um, from Rome. And my question uh, um, links both the question uh, to um, that you just answered and to the answer you just gave about uh, the fact that net that um, the networks. Uh, are already um, reputational uh, uh, already settles as it should so it is you say that it's fair by itself without need of external control and my question was about uh, do we need so um, the formalization that china has is that somewhat uh, logical is that somewhat reasonable because i was uh, impressed by the fact that you say that, that and uh, as i uh, i noticed that around society fake news are spreading so quickly. And well, the reputations are changing according to that, uh, often unjustly, maybe. And uh, so that, that, that happens, as you are, uh, just said. But you also then say that at the end, uh, they end up being fair. 
is, is that something that can remain constant or will we need some form of formalization as China did, hopefully to a lesser extent? But you say that that's not completely bad, that's just a formalization. And so that put it in a different light for me. And so yeah. if you could the uh, argument on that, and thank you again very much. I'm going to yeah. take another question and then you can answer two at a time. OK, Rupert? Yep. Gaia? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. OK, first of all, thank you very much. It has been really interesting. Um, I'm Gaia from the last year of Global Governance. Um, I had uh, a thought. Uh, let's say that as uh, game theory shows, uh, reputation plays a huge role in the economy uh, because on repeated games with a bit of uncertainty, if one player is able to build its reputation, he can possibly uh, end up in completely dictating how the, let's say the game will be played. So if we imagine this player as a country and if we, um, let's say, imagine ourselves doing repeated actions as a society or as we would like our government to do, what do you think is the role of media? And how can we try to understand if the reputation a country has is really the result of past agreements and actions that could be defined as correct and reliable, or if this result is uh, the result of an action controlled over time by media and someone else's interest. Because if this is the case, then reputation ends up being the result of a collective bias, and that will be really dangerous. So this was my, let's say, question. Thank you. Great. Gustavo, do you want me to take those two? Please, Robert. OK. Um, so the first question um, was really around, uh, if I summarize it correctly, uh, it was, it's around the idea of regulation. Um, is regulation and um, regulatory systems, are they needed? Um, uh, I'm not a fan of over-regulation, but I'm not a fan of no regulation. I think light touch regulation works. And I think uh, when it comes to uh, the, um, the reputation systems, uh, the Chinese example is obviously an extreme in one area, uh, but I think that there are um, responsible regulations around how information and reputations can be used, um, which should be considered. So um, now they, that already happens. So for example, um, there are um, some libel laws which stop people from libeling people. If we think about hard laws around that. Um, there are also, as we've talked about, um, some informal uh, rules around the uh, around um, market economics, uh, which mean that those organizations with good reputations get a better market share than those with bad reputations. So I think that this idea of balance is important. And I think that the system, Western capitalism, um, has a balance. I happen to believe that balance is out of balance at the moment. Um, and that's going to lead me, I think, onto Gaia's question of the imbalance and the role of media, and in and, and Gaia, I'm going to include social media, if I may, uh, in the answer I give back to yours. So, um, very interesting question. So you talk about game theory um, and about uh, uh, whether effectively um, uh, the um, the media. Well, you actually talked about it in state terms, and you're talking about the role of the media in holding states to account. Uh, can state actors be uh, be basically um, held to account by the media or not. Now, um, I think the media actually plays a super important role, um, uh, and it's and it's and it's holding organisations and individuals to account, despite some bad practices. I think in a really effective way. Um, it's not perfect, but it's the best thing that we've got. Um, to broaden it to your, the final bit of your question, which is really around stakeholder theory, as I see it, I'm, I'm an economist, but, uh, this, but the idea that you can be governed by basically mass media or collections of media interests as opposed to government wishes. Well, that's a question of whether you think the media basically sits on its own or whether it reflects society. That's a massive question. Um, again, I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's a pretty good approximation. And on the whole, uh, the traditional media plays a good role. The problem I think we've got is social media. 
And social media um, uh, plays now an outsized power. It has an outsized power and plays an outsized role, I believe, uh, in uh, policy development and in market economics. Um, that's just a personal view. But thank you for the question. Sophia. Um, uh, good morning, sir, and thank you for the very interesting conversation that you gave us. Uh, I want to make a premise first before my intervention, uh, because I, I know that... Uh, oh, sorry, I am uh, Sofia Basile from the second year of Global Governance. And uh, I wanted, to, like, when, um, when you were talking about the fact of um, societies based on reputation and the example of uh, China, what's going on, um, I don't know, but it came to my mind, the example of some uh, professions, uh, like, for example, um, the, 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 the delivery man uh, of some platforms like uh, Deliveroo, Just Eat, some, or Uber Eats, uh, all those kind of platforms, which are based on algorithms. And those algorithms determine uh, also the, um, the payment of uh, the service of those people. So, um, uh, however, this uh, remuneration based on the algorithm could not be considered as, cons as totally socially fair because uh, it raises issues based on the fact that, for example, many things that, that can happen during a shift, for example, an intense traffic, but also something else, or the fact that the workers are, um, may have to take risks of uh, high speed, for example, to keep a, a good evaluation of the algorithm, all those things uh, could be considered as, um, as, as an outcome of uh, this algorithm, which uh, is, a, is, a, is a kind of reputation, in my opinion. And I hope it made sense. And I would really like to see um, if, my sh if, if this long shot was uh, something correct. <laughs> thank you. Cornelius. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for this uh, insightful talk. Um, a very interesting uh, topic to, to tackle actually in these days. And uh, my name is Cornelius. I'm a third year student uh, from Global Governance from Germany. And um, I would like to pick up again the topic of uh, social media, uh, because as you have shown the, the hyper connectivity that uh, social media brought in the last uh, 10 years, um, I was curious about um, in the light of current cancel culture or also um, yeah, being quickly canceled online for political correctness or toxic political correctness maybe, do we have a problem with uh, these phenomenons in the sense that people or institutions and organizations might even hold back opinions or uh, hold back um, something that they want to communicate but don't uh, due to these uh, phenomena on social media and uh, the danger of having the reputation canceled so quickly, which is, um, or which might lead to a very uh, dangerous derogation of uh, very fundamental principles of free opinion, free speech in democratic uh, societies. Thank you very much again. Okay. Um, Again, two great questions. So Sophia's question on Deliveroo, Just Eats, and uh, the use of AI technology, and whether it's socially fair um, when it comes to wages. I, look, I, I, I think you're absolutely spot on, Sophia, on that. Um, uh, um, it sort of goes back to the limits of AI. Um, AI is fantastic at producing efficiency. I think it's far, far less useful in producing fairness. So when it comes to the, the use of AI to decide on um, the basis of a delivery rider's efficiency, fair enough. It might be a useful part of a tool, but by itself, it couldn't capture, of course, the traffic stuff or the other things they might've had to do to stop. And I think uh, if you rely on it to do um, uh, fairness assessments, I think AI is not suitable. Um, we're actually doing a big analysis of AI at the minute, the reputation of AI. And it turns out that there are three big problem areas, perception problem areas. The first is perceptions of privacy, of privacy invasion. 
The second is problems of bias. And the third is problems of what we call explicability. So we've taken 101 cases and separated them out into that. that that'll be published soon. So Sophia, yes, I agree. I, I think AI is not suited to doing fairness, uh, certainly on those questions. Um, Cornelius, uh, social media, hyperconnectivity, cancel culture. Wow, these are hot buttons, right? Very hot buttons. Um, uh, in the UK at the moment, we've got this big debate about the um, about Piers Morgan, who was the who was the Good Morning Britain presenter, uh, who was cancelled in his words uh, for taking Meghan Markle to task on whether she spoke the truth uh, in her interview with Oprah. Um, uh, so it's a huge subject, and I think it's a really big problem because uh, the power of social media to create this intensity of um, pressure, this, this massive pressure kettle uh, is very, very high. It's a very high intensity vehicle. It's also why, in my view, and it's just my view, that social media companies are too big. I think social companies need to be broken up and regulated because their outsized power is now at a point where, it, where they're affecting mass societal uh, issues. And when you go back to the origins of social media, um, I, I, I know some of the founders of Twitter reasonably well, and um, they started this never imagining, never imagining for a minute that there'd be half a billion users or a billion users. Never in a million years did they think that was the case. They started it, they launched it at South by Southwest in Austin, uh, which was an app to try and get people to get to, to coalesce around the right bar. Um, so, you know, the idea that this was scaled to have societal impact is something that the social media companies are themselves struggling with. Um, my, my view is that they're never going to solve it themselves and they actually need some really quite strict regulation. My own person, again, own personal view is that their argument that they should be treated as technology platforms as opposed to publishers uh, doesn't hold. Uh, they're now effectively publishers. And in that respect, if that they should be regulated as publishers, which changes their business model. And I think if they were regulated as publishers, I think you'd see some significant changes uh, in the way they were able to uh, produce certain pieces of content. I think you'd see more responsible action. And I think you'd have a better way for organizations to be able to uh, think about the pressure, pressure that, it, uh, that these organizations put onto policymaking. Great questions. <coughs> Beatrice. Hello everyone. Uh, firstly, thank you, Mrs. Young, for for providing this great reflection uh, for us today. Uh, my name is Beatriz. I'm from Brazil and a first year student. And my question goes with um, with the fact that, in my point of view, we have all this sort of least imposed by our society that we need to achieve. Uh, but many times we are not able to to do all of them and do it well. It feels that there, are, there is this huge pressure imposed by society to reach perfection, um, to be all and to be everything. But most of the times I, I see those parameters as unrealistic with our human limitations. Uh, so with that, how does the high standards of reputation can affect it negative, negatively uh, an effective capability of delivering of a person or a company. Thank you very much. Also, Professor Luigi Corvo had a question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I found your intervention very, very interesting. Uh, also, from another point of view, um, it's maybe related to the issue of fake news, but a little bit different, because um, we are facing a lot the issue of sustainability washing, let's say. Uh, and where in, in this context, the capacity of demonstrating you now the sustainability uh, behaviors, intentions, and then actions of organization is a key aspect of the reputation building. And what we are noticing, I don't, I don't know if you uh, addressed this kind of issue, 
um, greenwashing is one of the most um, known aspects, but also, also the social washing is another key aspect. Um, we are noticing, <clears throat> making several assessments of the impacts, you know, social and environmental impacts of organizations, we are noticing that when the uh, reputation is, and so the perceived reputation from stakeholders, you not know, by the stakeholder view that you mentioned before, is higher than the real impact, uh, it implies that the organizations has to manage inside you know, the, the measurement of the impacts. When the uh, measurement of impacts is aligned with the external perception, so with the reputation, then they can communicate their sustainability. You know? uh, so the reputation is quite a, a turnaround point also for the sustainability cycle of the organizations. And this is happening with some differences now among uh, public organizations, private for-profit organizations and private non-profit organizations. So this point of view would be very interesting to be deepened by you. Thank you very much. Um, great, thank you very much. Um, uh, Beatrice, um, your question is around when reputation um, uh, is too high, uh, when the expectations are too high and when reputation acts for the bad. Uh, again, that's a great question. I mean, the, all the questions have been fantastic. Um, uh, uh, it's a particular problem because reputation, and this is this actually comes straight back to the, to the title of this talk, which is that perceptions matter more than facts. Um, and when, so, that can be for the good. It can force people to do things. It can make people behave in a way that's pro-societal, et cetera, but it can also be for the bad too. Now, your point is actually that um, sometimes this goal of perfection, this idea of, you know, sort of trying to be everything really great uh, can sometimes lead to some really bad policy decisions, I think is a real risk. It's a real risk, um, uh, but it's incumbent on, uh, policymakers to understand the limitations of reputation. Actually, the mechanisms help in that respect, because what you've got is um, uh, this idea that if you're pitching something which is too far ahead of reality, reputation risk starts to increase as people start to see the difference between the two, the behaved actions and the and the goals. So actually there's a market part, there's, so there's like a sort of market mechanism there for reputation to kind of keep those two aligned. Um, and um, Luigi, um, I mean, it, it sort of leads into your question in a sense, um, because your question really picks this up in the context of greenwashing. Um, and I think, again, it's a fantastic uh, and very current problem, this, um, uh, where the work that we do uh, hits the question that you've got around this question of, you know, greenwashing and uh, this idea of, uh, of, of when you're promising too much, you've got to focus internally to change your behaviour, and when you've got alignment, you can communicate. I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, and that's, that's, that's where this body of work around authenticity comes. So, um, and we've been doing a lot of work on this and, and it's around this alignment. So we talk about behavioral signals, network choices and narratives. And when your narratives are ahead of your behaviors, you have to change your behaviors. Uh, you can't change, I mean, you can bring your narrative down if you want, possible, but sometimes mo but most companies don't like reducing their narrative commitments. They have to work on what they're, what they're actually signaling through their behaviors. So a lot of work around authenticity, um, which I'm happy to share with you um, if you're interested in that. Tommaso. So hi, I'm Tommaso Celani from the third year of Global Governance. Uh, thank you for the very interesting speech and I hope that you can hear me clearly. Um, so what, what I, will, I had just a few remarks. Uh, I was thinking about the, the 
the title of this conversation and I was uh, thinking about, I don't know if you know the market for fake gurus on investment that there is on the internet. There is a huge market basically on uh, these people which are pure image in which they post photos of nice cars saying buy my course. And so they're basically living off of reputation and I find it very interesting that it is completely far from the truth. Uh, on the second point, while we were speaking about the importance of social media reputation, I was thinking about uh, an episode from the Netflix series uh, Black um, Mirror. Ne exactly, in which there is the there is some sort of social credit system based on stars and reputation of the other people, which influence everything, uh, e even up to the interest interest rate on loans for buying houses. Now, um, I don't know if it if it is a question of whether we can or not get to that point, but it is more a question of how far are we to that point. Do you agree to this type of view? Thank you. Rupert, we also have a question on the chat by Luciana. She's a first year student from Argentina. She asks, what do you think is the cost of cancel culture in our volatile, volatile society where everything seems to be important in one moment and will be forgotten quickly? Do you think reputation has in some sense lost its true meaning to, due to this? Thank you. You can go, go and respond to these two. Okay. Um, uh, so, Tommaso, first of all, uh, congratulations on your background. Um, uh, it looks like you're in the middle of a space shuttle somewhere. Um, uh, uh, I'm assuming that's a background and not real. If it's real, I'm even more impressed. Um, the, uh, uh, the, um, I mean, the market for fake gurus, this is something which, of course, uh, I mean, that the sort of fake expert market, uh, that existed online, offline. It's a very old, very old uh, um, subject, this. Um, and it's um, actually reputation, uh, uh, yes, it does enable them to set up because they can borrow reputations perhaps from other people, but actually reputation normally shuts these markets down quicker than anything else, quicker than regulation, quicker than anything else, because people quickly see that it's a fake market and you'll have some pretty motivated people to post that these are fake markets and fake reviews. Um, so reputation actually normally acts in a positive way. The really interesting stuff comes when you look at some work done by one of my colleagues, um, uh, who's, um, uh, who's a professor in the marketing um, uh, side at Oxford with me, uh, is on the dark web. And what's happening now is that these type of, uh, uh, of, 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 of fake gurus markets and also legal markets for drugs and arms and everything else, they go into the dark web now. And the dark web, when you go into the dark web, it's extraordinary. Uh, it, it looks like eBay, um, but they're selling, you know, drugs and stuff. And you get, you know, you, you sort of get sort of feedback mechanisms like, yeah, this is not a police site. Uh, yeah, this is, you know, the quality of this, this, this cocaine is really good. And they, you know, it's, 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 it's an entirely different. Um, it's the same market, but it's been driven into the dark web. And I think one of the biggest problems we're going to have is how to regulate the dark web not regulate the, the real web. And that's gonna be an emerging problem. I think uh, um, uh, to Luciana's question, um, uh, um, uh, uh, well, actually, sorry, to your second point, Tommaso, on Black Mirror. Yeah, I've, 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 been a, I've, I've watched Black Mirror, uh, all the episodes, because it's just futuristic sort of uh, kind of fun. Um, but some of it's kind of very real. I mean, that episode that you're talking about of, of this girl who, she had social capital and she wanted to move to another property and she didn't have the money or the social credit. So she tried too hard and ended up in 40 minutes destroying herself down to a you know two points as opposed to five points. Extraordinary, right? But you can see that happening. You can see that happening in real life. So it's supposed to be a futuristic dystopian world. I'd argue it's pretty close um, in lots of ways. Uh, Luciana's question, um, uh, there's the, the cost of cancel culture. I think the cost of cancel culture is um, uh, significant. I would go to the gallows to defend the right to free speech. Um, uh, that's why I'm in academia. Um, uh, and I think that um, actually reputation, I think, is enormously helpful. I think it doubles down as a really effective market mechanism. Because if you are a true lunatic and you're saying stuff which is just simply not acceptable, 
the reputation mechanisms move again so much faster than any of the forms of regulatory mechanisms that exist. So, um, so I'm uh, yes, it's a huge issue. Cancel culture is um, a, a really big problem, and I hope it doesn't go any further because I think people should be free to say what they want. Uh, but that there needs to be a an open discourse so that if that is seen to be unacceptable, then it's shown and shouted out to be unacceptable. Um, uh, the, the, it's not perfect, but the, but the opposite, where you have state control, is definitely not better, to my view. Thank you, Luciana, for the question. Paolo. Good morning. Thanks very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, my question was actually if there are some strategies and ways uh, through which we can influence the reputation that the other has on us, of course, but also when thinking about an organization and in particular about, uh, for instance, a startup for which uh, building a reputation is a crucial issue. And my second question is, if you have some books uh, or research that you suggest to read uh, in order to know something more about this issue, also on the economic side. Thanks very much. Arman. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good morning. My name is Arman uh, and I'm a second year student of Globe Governance. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for such an interactive and thought provoking presentation. It was a pleasure. Um, the reflecting on the importance of reputation, I was thinking about um, nonprofits, for example, and I feel like reputational issues uh, for nonprofits and governments are probably even more important than for firms, since uh, a large part of their revenues would come from donors and from government grants. So I was just wondering how maybe reputational issues affect nonprofits um, and what could maybe be done to put them on a more equal footing with the firms and maybe if that would be a good idea in your opinion. Um, I hope I was clear and thank you very much again. Very clear, thank you Armin. So um, Paolo, um, uh, startup reputations, really interesting question, thank you for it. Um, uh, it's obviously um, as a startup uh, you, ha you haven't got anything to draw on in terms of your history, right? Um, so it's a great question. Um, what most companies or most organizations in the startup sphere do is focus obviously on sending the right behavioral signals, but the most important early things you can do are your network choices. If you think about your network choices, um, your, let's take funding. So if you are a technology startup and you secure some funding from Andreessen Horowitz, um, uh, or one of those great Silicon Valley names. Um, that acts as an accelerator, opening the doors to every other investment house that you've got. If it's good enough for them, it's good enough for a whole bunch of other people. So the networks and investing your time in network development is really super important. Um, I met, uh, and, and, and I'm telling you the story because it shows you the power of the network, but actually for bad, uh, is I met um, the lady who founded Theranos, if you remember that story, uh, Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, this is this blood testing technology that was supposed to revolutionize the speed at which you could get your blood uh, tested. And it, was, uh, and, and it was an extraordinary Silicon Valley startup by this, um, uh, by this amazing girl called Elizabeth Holmes, um, uh, who sort of saw herself as this sort of female Steve Jobs. Um, and uh, she did an incredibly smart uh, and, and very effective thing right at the start, uh, even though her technology was not as good as she actually claimed it was, but because she managed to get a board, she managed to borrow reputations from creating a board who were incredibly senior and well-respected people, including Henry Kissinger, former ex, uh, head of, uh, um, uh, um, Secretary of State in the US, uh, Rupert Murdoch, you know, a whole bunch of really powerful people. And just the fact that they were on the board was a signal that this was a startup going somewhere. So um, in the startup area, I would recommend that, they, that it's that focus on the networks and borrowing and lending, uh, which is a critical um, differentiator. 
um, as opposed to the you know the the, the type of books that I uh, think are are you know are relevant on all of things on all of these. I mean, obviously you can read my book, which is obviously um, it's it's uh, it's a bestseller for a reason. Um, but I think that there's a few other ones that I would recommend, um, uh, which I've got all on my wall here. I mean, there's one by Jeremy Hyman's and Henry Tim's called New Power. I would recommend that one. It's a great book. Um, obviously, you've got my one there, The Reputation Game. Um, uh, what else would I recommend? Um, That's it for the moment. The, the Reputation Game is a great book. Um, thank you, Stefano. So um, now, um, uh, Armin, um, uh, so uh, this idea of how can you put nonprofits or governments on an equal footing when it comes to firms? I mean, actually, I think, I mean, it's, again, like all the questions, a great question. I sort of would put it the other way, which is that um, nonprofits, I think, have a higher um, reputation than businesses. And in, in a way, reputation works much more effectively than, for them than it does for businesses. I sit a, uh, I chair the governance committee of the Halo Trust. This is this incredible uh, charity that I'm so proud to be on the board of, uh, which uh, takes landmines out of the ground. A very dangerous job. Uh, 9,000 people all over the world digging out these incredibly indiscriminate weapons of war. Um, from very dangerous places, from Somalia to Afghanistan to Sri Lanka, all over the world. Um, uh, our donors, uh, um, you know, th the reputations that we have drive government and private philanthropy donors. And um, I'd say that we are seen almost immediately because we're an NGO uh, and a charitable NGO de dealing in that. Before we do anything, we've got this halo effect. Whereas if I'm a private contractor doing that, I probably haven't got it. So I think it's, you know, but that's a sort of narrative strategy, right? I mean, you know, if you're a charity or seem to be a charity, immediately you think you're good. <laughs> it's sort of interesting. Um, uh, um, so that's my answer to that one. Okay, I have a long comment, which I hope I'm gonna be able to read with my mouse uh, by Rosa Bruno. The problem with this ongoing phenomena of cancel culture is that as of now, instead of seeing someone living authentically in a linear fashion, technology allows us to peer at any stage of people's existence. Almost everyone has everything documented at all ages and stages of life. So when we check a person's content on big online platforms, such as YouTube or Instagram, we do not really consider the fact that if such a person has been on the platform for a very long time, not every photo, not every uh, video, sorry, I lost my track. Um, Don't worry, I've got it here, I can see it. You see it there? Because I, I, my mouse jumped. Yeah. The online persona is not considered the product of many years of growth, but rather a crystallized version of itself. That allows people to see a past moment like it is still present and to cancel individual for long forgotten mistakes. For example, an increasing number of young influencers have abandoned social media platform, influencers have abandoned social media platforms as a result of their online community being horrified with something they said or did in the past, ignoring the different social contexts they were in, the lack of awareness on certain topics during those past years, and the subsequent positive evolution of the person in question. That's why in my opinion, modern reputation is a complete illusion. So that's her comment that you may want to comment. And then now we have Uyanga. Uh, hello, Professor. I am Uyanga. I'm from the GG3. And I have uh, three or two small questions. First one is how to deal with the reputation and reality gap. And the second one was uh, how does the power balance of the reputation change the dynamic of the reputation? M meaning that the uh, last, I remember that you were mentioning about the Chinese credit system, which uh, was compared to the Uber system. However, as I read, as I remember, the Uber actually allows the drivers to actually rate the customers and customers to read rate the driver. So there is a power balance is actually really good. However, in Chinese um, version, 
its power balance is a bit low as the government is allowed to rate. However, the people are don't have any opinion towards the government. And what do you think about this? Thank you. Great. Okay. So um, uh, the um, Rosa, uh, the questions that you had on uh, cancel culture and social media. Um, yeah, I mean, thank goodness social media didn't exist when I was your age. That's all I can say. Um, uh, because none of us really um, live blameless lives uh, through, you know, through thick and thin. Um, and the idea of having everything uh, that you've ever said immortalized and thrown back at you at any time in, in any context is clearly not right. It's clearly not right. Um, this is partly my problem with the social media um, construct. They were not set up to deal with this type of activity and this type of um, social sort of governance. Um, uh, I think it's a real problem that, that people get quoted out of context. Um, uh, think about changing norms. So if someone says something 10 years ago and the norms have changed, they can look incredibly foolish 10 years later when actually at the time they weren't looking foolish. Um, uh, so I think it's very problematic, all of that. Um, uh, and uh, which is also why I think there should be more regulation and these should be much more tightly regulated as companies and they should be smaller um, and there should be more competition. Um, ultimately, I think though that it's down to people to realize that uh, what they put on social media is up to them. Um, and, um, you know, you have a choice to play the game or not. Um, I think it's actually a wild east or wild west at the minute and i think it needs some significant reform um uh mainly because of all the bad stuff that we all see which is these you know extraordinarily um dangerous uh, sort of polarized communities uh, the fact that actually that we all just receive the things that we think we want to hear uh and there's a whole range of algorithmic stuff which is problematic anyway that's so Rosa I agree with you it's a real problem actually reputation um actually acts as a moderator to this it's a real help to this mm. um uh, uh the and um Uyanga your point um your two questions the reputation and reality gap um uh, again the most effective way of getting someone to change their behavior so that it then meets with what they would like to be seen at seen as is a reputation that's the most effective mechanism. Regulation doesn't do it. I mean, it used to be called peer pressure, social peer pressure. Um, and I'm just using reputation as a sort of short form for that. Your second point is a much more tricky question. Um, and I agree, it's a big issue, this power balance and imbalance. And you're quite right, by the way, to call me out that this was uh, that, that you're comparing apples and pears um, because the Chinese state system is not a two-way system, as you say. What the Chinese state system, though, is, is it does bring out different stakeholder views into one platform. Um, uh, uh, there is no right of reply. That's a massive problem in the Chinese state system, to my view, um, uh, because a marketplace should have some form of right to not play in the market. Um, what China's done is to make that not possible. You have to play and, and it's only one sided. So I agree that's a that's a that's a big problem. And I'm certainly not advocating that that's what Western or other governments should do. I pointed it out because organizations and governments can choose to do this. Um, think about actually, I mean, you know, if you think about some of the internal um, systems that, that some organizations now have, uh, where they post, you know, sort of stuff, I mean, that is, it's, it's verging on that social control within an organization too. So um, it's something to be watched. But thank you for your challenge. I, I agree that I should be held further to account for that. If we're quick enough, we're going to be able to handle all. So uh, Rani and Alessio now with uh, not too long questions. Hi, hello, Professor. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I'm Rani al Sarakibi from Syria, and I'm a first year global governance student. My question is, we are currently living in an increasingly polarized society, mainly due to people following the certain media outlets that they agree with while ignoring everything else. 
which is something a bit dangerous because they only get one perspective. This problem is mainly exaggerated, exaggerated by computer algorithms that feed you based on what you want to see. For example, you visit one website, for example, right-wing website, all your feed is going to be a right-wing. And also the so-called fact checks on social media, such as Instagram, that are far from being fact checks, as we've seen with many examples when it comes to certain uh, right-wing posts. Uh, so my question to you, how big of a problem do you view this uh, issue? And uh, how could you advise us to avoid falling into this trap? And lastly, as you mentioned, there needs to be regulation. So how can these media outlets be regulated without overstepping uh, the boundaries of the rights of freedom of speech and expression? So basically, where do we draw the, where do we draw the line and who gets to decide? Thank you. Alessio. Thanks, Professor. Good morning, sir. I hope can you hear me and uh, thank you a lot for your presentation. A little bit higher voice, Alessio. Okay. My name is Alessio Uma. I'm a third year student of Gigi. And uh, I've always been a fan of um, hyperconnectivity and interconnectivity because it allows you to, you to reach uh, huge forms of efficiency if you have a really fast exchange of information. However, I was surprised when you said that in an hyperconnectivity era, reputation, uh, it's gained a lot of importance because even if what you said is completely true, uh, I was always used to see it the other way around, which is thanks to hyperconnectivity, a lot of individuals can, let's say, put aside all the reputation noise and find uh, uh, very reliable information for themselves, which maybe before, I don't know, we'll say the advent of internet was, wasn't possible. So use the expression before, as soon as reputation gets around the world, uh, truth it's, put, it's putting on its sneakers. Do you think that actually, we, uh, thanks to hyperconnectivity, this gap of speed between um, uh, reputation and truth is closing off or is it worsening? Thank you very much. Great, okay. Uh, well, Rani, um, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, uh, so, so how big is the problem of, of, of polarization and these sort of echo chambers? It's a huge problem. A massive problem. Um, uh, what, what's the what's the answer? How can you protect yourself against it? Well, I tell you what I do. I'm not suggesting this this necessarily works, but what I do is I actively click on things that I don't like. So I so I try and train my algorithm to send me stuff that I either disagree with or don't like. Um, uh, so uh, uh, maybe I just think get a worst feed of everything but that's that's my small protest um, against the algorithm and um, uh, the the how should regulation work I think that uh, the social media companies should be regulated as, as publishers not as technology platforms if you did that a lot will change a lot will change because they're subject to libel laws they're subject to all sorts of things for the content that they put on their platforms um, Alessio, um, uh, again, great challenge, hyperconnectivity. Yeah, I mean, in efficient markets, of course, uh, you'd be absolutely spot on because hyperconnectivity just means we have access to actual fact much more quickly. The problem is, is that in, in, the, in the inefficient markets, what moves fastest is rumor, gossip, and views and opinions. And rumor and gossip and views and opinions are the bread and butter of reputation. Hey, geez. Um, okay, thank you very much for this uh, amazing conversation. Um, I did not want to miss such an opportunity like your worthy ideas and I want to learn as much as I can from you. We live in a world where people increasingly trust less to each other and therefore much they're being much more selfish and that forces people to think themselves before and want them to be the only one who is appreciated and we are youth generations that will attend to this great world with brand new and fresh ideas and my question is what are the most important uh, steps and the first steps for new and work weak entrepreneurs should take to gain reputation more and my second question was to suggest you to some books to us, but my colleague Paolo has already asked that. So thank you very much. Rupert, Rupert I'm just gonna read you the two last questions and then I, I, we do not accept anymore. There's Benedetta who wrote, 
usually or GG1, usually organizations or ONGs, which have a really important, good reputation all over the world, use it in order to convince the consumer that he's doing the right things consuming their products. But they actually go against the value of the company. For example, the organization Save the Dolphins that promotes, um, sorry, again, my problem with that, uh, save, that promotes a sustainable say, sale of its products when in reality they do not respect the rules for a sustainable fishery how can we know which company is using its reputation in order uh, to manipulate us consuming their products and finally arianna um an italian second year student i will write my questions here okay um in the context of the current pandemic in order to influence risk perception and properly engage the community risk communication is needed since it has the power to influence the behavior of individuals. Um, it, it, it risks to be ineffective when there is mistrust towards the authorities, mistrust that comes from a bad perception and reputation of the authorities, in particular when it comes to minorities and mistreated groups that are more reluctant to follow guidelines. My question is, is it possible for the authorities to improve their reputation and build trust in uh, um, in a very short sp uh, span of time, given the urgency of the matter, and how relevant is it in this context? That's it. Um, well, thank you, uh, Elgis, Benedetta, and Ariana. I'm going to actually uh, combine Ariana's and Elgis's question um, because, in a way, you're both addressing this issue of institutional trust. Um, uh, Elgis, you talked about being there being less trust. Uh, um, uh, and uh, the sort of more selfish stuff. And I think, again, um, Ariana, you're mentioning this idea of institutional trust and this idea of how, you know, that there's mistrust towards the authorities. Um, I think that is right. Um, uh, some work done by a colleague of mine, again, a different colleague of mine at Oxford, has, has, has re rethought the idea of trust from historically being horizontal, if you can think of it as a sort of, in a pictorial sense, Trust used to be horizontal. If someone was the chief executive or the head of a country or the head of an institution, you trusted them because they were the governor of the Bank of England, the president of Italy, the chief executive of a company. There was that sense of hierarchical trust. Today, that's gone. People aren't trusted because of the nature of their position anymore. And in a way, the horizontal axis has gone to, uh, sorry, the, the, the vertical axis has gone horizontal. So trust is now horizontal in that we trust people who look and feel like us. So if you think about eBay uh, or TripAdvisor, let's say, so on TripAdvisor, um, if you get a post from the restaurant saying this is a wonderful restaurant, great food, you go, mm, yeah, maybe they'd say that anyway. Whereas in fact, if you have a user who says I was there last week and it was terrible, you'll trust that more than you trust the, uh, the owner of the restaurant. So trust has sort of gone from being vertical and institutional to horizontal trusting people like us. And it's a massive problem for institutions because institutions have to then earn trust in a different way, not just by the fact that they exist. Um, so I think, uh, I, I, and uh, that's actually, I don't blame the system of trust changing. I think it's right that it's become democratized. I think that institutions have to build and work on their own legitimacy in a far more active way. Um, uh, Elgis, uh, uh, and then Benedetta, um, uh, this idea uh, 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 around um, reputation, um, NGOs, yes, and reputation, and this is the question on uh, the dolphins, save the dolphins, yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, um, today is a very good example, your post and this discussion is a great example of the reputation market at play. I'm now going to take a look at that organization. And if I see that organization, I'm going to have a think and say, actually, I'm not sure that it does what it says. It doesn't save the dolphins um, because they don't, just because they don't respect the rules for a sustainable fishery, because you've told me that. Now, I'll probably look into it. I'll probably have a little bit of a check around, but this is exactly what the reputation marketplace is about. It's about the sharing of democratized ideas, uh, which will hold organizations to account in a much, much more fluid way than organizations can be held to account by regulation. So a great example of the reputation marketplace. When you were talking about institutions, I couldn't stop thinking about how universities 
also have to change with respect to the vertical and horizontal model over the, the centuries and uh, the current challenges that universities face in this direction. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, Gustavo. I mean, it's a, you know, it's, and often these institutions are not used to challenge because they don't get the sort of direct challenges. They get the sort of systematized challenges, but having big pressure points from users is, is something they're not used to doing. Um, and, um, but they've got to change. I think that's, a, that's the nature of this hyper-connected, democratized world that we're in, is that the institutional systems need to change. Yeah. Stefano, you want to say a few words before I say goodbye to our guest? I don't know if Stefan is still here. I don't see him anymore. Maybe he has disconnected. Let me see. Yeah, maybe he's not here. So um, let me, well, anyway, let me thank uh, uh, profusely Intesa San Paolo uh, on behalf of all the GG1, GG2, GG3 for this wonderful possibility of having these two great speakers and this fantastic program of visiting professorships here at Global Governance. But let me thank especially profusely today, Professor Rupert Younger for this wonderful, wonderful talk. I think we can measure the success of this talk by the amount of questions that there have been. And I'm glad that he has been able to respond to all of them. It was also a lecture, let's not forget it, for all of you and for our, all of ourselves about capability and character. Those, those two key words that we should take home anyway, no matter what. So, uh, Professor Younger, Rupert, thank you so much. It was our delightful for all of us. Please put your microphone on as is tradition in global governance. And we can say goodbye to our guest. Rupert, it was a wonderful day. We hope to have you in Rome. On behalf of GG1, GG2, and GG3, thank you so much again. Great pleasure. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Rupert, thank you again. Hope to see you in the next months. Well, Gustavo, first of all, thank you for, ha for having me. And what a great group. Um, uh, you know, a really, really uh, engaging group and some really fantastic questions. So I'm impressed with the quality of your cohort. Thank you so much. Indeed, they are a fantastic bunch and uh, we are very proud of them. Good. Well, thank you so much and um, hopefully see you in Rome. Absolutely. Invitation pending. <laughs> okay, great. Bye bye now. Thank you, Chuck. Bye.